Number 34, boy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Bedroom Super Producer Podcast. We are your hosts. My name is JT. My name is BK. And we are going back to the roots of EDM today, BK, aren't we? I think we could say it's the roots. I call it the banging beginnings. And uh, this uh, quartet slash trio has indeed some of the biggest bangers of all times in the, the rave slash techno slash drum and bass would you say uh arena and who are we going to talk about dissect analyze today bk first of all you're referring to the the group the band the prodigy one of my favorite bands of all time And uh, yes, we're going to dive in uh, a little bit deeper into their electronic slash, uh, slash dance slash music slash breakbeat, uh, big beat influence. We talked about the Chemical Brothers a couple of weeks ago. They were part of that era, the beginning of the 90s, um, that breakbeat era with the fat boy slims of this world, the, the chemicals. So yeah, we're going to dig deep and talk about... Uh, Liam Howlett, uh, Keith Flint, and uh, Maxim, well, the, the three main Prodigy members. We could also say that probably uh, Leroy Thornhill was also a, a big influence in that band. I think the, the keyboard player from way back. And yeah, we're going to go through uh, their albums, uh, the way they make music, their super mega hits, uh, all the way from Fat of the Land Uh, to the more recent stuff, uh, No Tourist. And yeah, dig deep into that huge influence of mine because I, I love their style. And yeah, so let's get into it. So my first question for you, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a Prodigy fan, but nowhere near as big a fan as you are. I mean, I discovered a lot of their material through listening to music just randomly with you. Did you start with Experience or Fat of the Land? Um, I think the first time I listened to them, it was probably, I knew the older tracks, but I didn't know it was the Prodigy. And when they first got on like my map was really Fat of the Land, probably Firestarter in uh, 97. So I was always wondering how they made those sounds, that those huge 808s in your face, like how did they come up with all those sounds? Because there's nothing sounded like that, right? So yeah, so it was probably uh, Fat of the Land that was, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, Smack My Bitch Up, those classics. Yeah, I think I think I uh, the first track I heard was Smack My Bitch Up, also because of the uh, like the highly controversial video that they had put out, one of those videos that had to be aired on uh, Music Plus probably around midnight because of the graphic content of the video. That's the video where uh, it's first uh, person camera thing and uh, the, the person behind the camera is beating up on a lot of people and then you yeah, just, realize uh, at the very end that it's a woman, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I got to say, I, I, I went back to experience uh, while, researching the, um, while researching the band and, and the episode, but I got to say that Even though some of the diehard fans will say that this is where they really innovated and, and, and made a name for themselves, I, I gotta say, Fat of the Land is so many steps beyond experience in terms of quality of production and the richness of the mixes. Uh, so, I mean, let's, let's, let's start with Fat of the Land. What strikes you production-wise? Or, yeah, go ahead if you wanted to go back to experience. But uh. What you have to understand is that I went back to the earlier recordings. Of course, it wasn't the same energy as Fat of the Land. If you take tracks like uh, Out of Space or uh, Charlie or stuff. Like so they were mostly influenced by, by rave culture. So the sounds weren't quite, quite there. It was, they were a little bit more blippy. 
he already had started using the the Moog Prodigy because their name is from the the Prodigy synthesizers from Moog, using Roland gear and everything. And so their sound came from the rave scenes. And um, Liam was also a DJ at raves, and that's how I think they first met. Uh, he first met uh, Keith Flint or whatever, which was uh, a dancer, and that's kind of how they got together. I think at the beginning it was a little bit more um, not happy, but more like dance oriented and i remember like way way back they had these in the raves it was very oriented towards um they had a lot of cartoons animation the first the for the first uh like videographer that i call them that that would match old old cartoons or old tv series to to the music that was playing and so like all these things came together and so they kind of had a sound that was a little bit like juvenile, right? Yeah, with the high-pitched samples. Exactly. It did give it kind of a jiggier feel. Exactly. It's a very, well, very like sweet and like kids at a party and raving. And so so I can understand why the first albums were the way they they were, right? And then if you move along, then you get something that, starts to get a little bit darker so you have the music for a jilted generation that gets a little bit more heavier and they're trying to get away from that kiddish kind of sound and you get songs like their law and like voodoo people and uh, claustrophobic sting and it gets a little bit the hard driving drums start to make their way to the surface and then well you get to that special album in 97 which was almost three years after music for the Jilted Generation. And you kind of get one of, I, could, I should say, probably their masterpiece, which in, in my opinion, which is Fat of the Land, where they just put everything together, kind of gave the, the MCs a new look, something more devilish. Keith Flint had a pretty drastic change. If you take a look at the earlier videos where they're mostly dancers and almost like partying on beaches and influenced by reggae and, you know, a little bit more colorful. And then you get this dark persona, these harder driving sounds, like over the top sounds. And then you get something like Fat of the Land. I just wanted to go real quick back to the earlier days when they uh, weren't quite signed to Excel recordings. And uh, I read somewhere that uh, Liam Howlett was producing on a, on a Roland W30. Yeah. Which is kind of an ASR 10 when you think about it. It's basically just a sampling workstation with a keyboard. With that special 12-bit, 14-bit sampling engine that's kind of reminiscent of the MPC 3000. Oh, so that's why it had right that, that kind gra of granular grit. exactly the yeah. grit. I think the the converters on the Roland are 16, 16 bits, but the sampling engine is 12, something mm, like that. that. So so that it gives explain... it that 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 greediness and that that's je ne sais quoi, that thing that sometimes we don't quite know where it comes from. Yeah, that kind of uh, the samples all sound bad, but somehow they have energy. So you... yeah overlook the the degradation <laughs> yeah they sound bad together <laughs> yeah that's it but uh he was saying that because apparently unlike the A asr 10 it has like eight uh outs on the back and he would directly mix and route those eight outs directly to tape and that was the first time i've ever he ever heard of someone doing that to uh capture you know like an ep or or even an album so, yeah, I mean, sometimes you wonder how these guys who are probably broke end up, you know, owning all of this gear at a very young age and already have the know-how to do things like that to uh, to capture their, their musical ideas. I, I thought it was fascinating because at my, I mean, Howlett's probably, I don't know, 10 years older than me, but in 96 or no, no 94 when was uh, Experience released? 92, right? That's early, 92, yeah. Yeah, I was like 10 to 12. So there was no way I could put my hands on any kind of gear remotely close to that. So sometimes I just wonder how these guys, they're, they're crafty in the way they, uh, they, they save up money and uh, 
invest in the right bits of gear to uh, to get that that kind of sound. Because I mean, probably a year or two later, I or later I would get my hands on my first sound canvas by Roland, and honestly, there's no way you could produce a Prodigy track with a sound canvas module, right? So yeah. Anyways, that was my uh, my reflection on uh, their earlier material and the, the the gear that they used. But uh, going back to your question, which was fat of the land, I mean, to me, uh, it was a very very big influence, obviously, because th to me they're the big three: them, Daft Punk, and Chemical Brothers. Uh, in the early to mid '90s, were really the like the three bands that I was like. This is what I want to do, you know, mm. and yeah. uh, and especially Prodigy and Daft Punk and and the way I I perceive still to this day Prodigy, it's really sped up hip hop with an like a distortion and electronics, but it has that that uh, like energy that hip hop later on uh, brought to me. And uh, the way they would layer, like, sped up breakbeats with the 909 kick to me was really the signature sound of that, like that punch, that incredible punch that the, the Prodigy drums have. Yeah, exactly. So that, that was one thing. And then obviously on Fat of the Land, they really had a knack for these ultra catchy little synthesizer loops you know this is where they really made their mark on it's kind of like distorted sped up funk somehow mm. yeah but faster but then yeah the way they will bring the bass from the bottom and switch it down like a, a fifth or something it gave it that super dark uh vibe is where really you get that prodigy recipe, if you will. It's a perfect marriage between big beat and breaks, and they weren't using the same breaks that everyone else was were using, and they still found a way to sample stuff that was very in a very innovative fashion, and also the f how they they just pushed those channels for the drums to the extreme was like for me was amazing how they could keep it tight. And still, everything was louder than anyone else we were listening to, right? But it was still just under, like, it wasn't distorting, but it was highly compressed. Lots of overdrive. Um, lots of noise. Lots of, like, frequencies that usually you would tame, but there was, like, pff, one to three Ks cranked up, you know? And you couldn't understand why it sounded that way, but it sounded that way because... They were pretty much ignoring what everyone else were doing to have a smooth, like a smooth sound to to not go over the limits of this this special cons uh, console they were using, or not destroy the sound by overdriving it too much, or not over compressing it too much. And they were just doing no. We wanted to be aggressive, and we we're gonna just beat the hell out of it. And that's I've always admired that how they could keep the control and still go all out and destroy everything. And it's funny because I realized this the other day while I was listening to it, they did like, we did this podcast where we talked about how you like to tune your drums to fit the tracks. Right. And that's exactly what they're doing. Sometimes you're asking yourself, how come it fits so well, the bass and the drums and the kick, everything fits so well. And then you realize it's because the drums are tuned exactly to the bass part all throughout the song. So you, so they're not just tuning to the root of the song. He's tuning that 909 or that 808 to the root note of the bass all throughout the song. And that's why it can gel super tightly and i think it's one of the secrets how he can push everything so hard because it gels in a specific frequency range and you can either boost that frequency super high or remove things around it so that that single that centered thing that you want to hear just explodes 
in your face on the record. I, I was always very impressed by the way they mix stuff and the way everything just sounded much louder than everyone else. <laughs> so to expand on that uh, idea of their their smack, their their trademark smack, you're the one who actually uh, put me on the to that special board that they've been using throughout the years. The 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 Mackey, I think it's the 32-8. Wasn't it the DB DB32 or something? It's the same board yeah. that uh, Eamon Tobin used at the beginning, right? Oh yeah, I didn't know that Eamon Tobin think used that. It was a board, it was half and half. It was a board, it was a mixer, an analog mixer, but also with converters or whatnot. But also you could like automate things so you could automate your mix on it while i think um like throwing out each channel out individually or something i don't remember exactly how i remember it was super expensive that's what i remember <laughs> <laughs> so but, but yeah i mean you, you can hear liam howlett talk about this board all the time i mean even from the early days to, to now uh if there's one piece of kit that he'll Maybe not now in 2018, 2020, but I mean, the first like three, four albums were definitely pre-mixed at least on this board. And and what I find fascinating, and we're talking about punch, we're talking about compression, saturation, all things that are quite tricky to get right if you're mixing in the box. But for our audience out there, if you're looking for you know, this inaudible compression slash saturation, maybe a cool little outboard mixer like that uh, could do the trick because he's on the record several times speaking about how he, like you said, he was pushing every channel on that board to its maximum. And, and, and some of those boards, if you find the right one, have a very musical saturation and compression uh, to them once you push the channel just a bit too much probably even getting some red on the on the uh, the vus there yeah they have a they have an analog component to them so you can push them like the the mic the mixers they have preamps right so you can push them in the analog domain and they're not solely linked to they're not like a MIDI controller, which controls just a fader of what's going on inside, and then you're just like pushing out from like just converting. You literally can push out your sound through um, preamps, and to I think I'm not even sure if the, the this that board had like onboard EQs and onboard compressors. I think if there were like card slots that you could like insert insert like EQs and I don't remember that that thing we never had that one but like I said if you can pretty much use it kind of like an analog console pushing your sound takes a whole new meaning right we were talking about that with, uh, with the on the dead mouse podcast um, even to this day people who makes in the box and who make most of their stuff in the box at the end of the process they do want to go through some sort of analog, be it at the mastering stage, be it at the tracking stage when you're exporting every every track out before sending it to, to mastering or doing some sort of analog summing. So that analog, the conversion and to go through those circuitry, it gives it sometimes that warmth and sometimes you can push the push the sound in a different way i'm sure there's a way to do that in the box and i'm sure today you can find limiters that are way faster when they're digital and when they when there's look ahead and they can cut your sound way before it starts distorting but i'm sure like you said that there's a musical way of doing it and those boards i think the d8b is a perfect example all along maybe not in the same class as a, a neve console or a um, an SSL console, but I'm sure those external boards give your sound that little greediness and that that little noise or that added noise from conversion or that pass through this specific preamps that they have on board to give it that additional sizzle. Of course, 
you have to know how to use it. You have to know how to push it. You have to destroy your sound first before knowing exactly how much to back it off just to, to be at the limit of, of what you require. But yeah, um, and he had a pretty good recipe. And you said the magic word also, the, the, the summing aspect is what sometimes kills us laptop and computer producers. Uh, I mean, we were talking off air about, you know, mixing the drum sound of a uh, of thriller or trying to get close to that sound. And uh, I talked to some guy on uh, Instagram because he had this demo. It was for Halloween. And uh, he had that drum sound to, to a T. And I asked him what the secret was. And one of the secrets that I, I had never heard of was uh, analog summing emulation in plugin form so uh i've tried that the uh it's a waves it's the waves nls plugin i don't know if you have ever heard of it or even tried it no i've never tried it yeah but basically this plugin does emulate three old analog consoles uh one is ssl one is um kind of an old English board, like an Abbey Rhodes type board, I think. I'm not sure. And then the the last one is a Neve one. And it's really interesting because it does bring out the sounds more and it does also saturate the sounds in, in some way. All of that to say that uh, we need to be conscious as, uh, you know, studio musicians and, and especially centering our work around the computer, that the summing is quite different from even the cheapest of uh, outboard uh, mixers, you know? Of course, the, the sound in the box is very, very, very different than something that you would get um, from like any, like, like tracks that go through a console or feeding your tracks directly from the computer to the console. So it's always... Uh, the computer has brought the 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 easy easiness or the the easy way to to be able to record pretty much anything anywhere, not be limited by tape length or the time of recording. But at the same time, it brought another issue. It doesn't sound exactly like what it would sound on a console. Um, you get a little bit a little bit more harshness. Since we're now recording in the digital domain and we're listening also in the digital domain, there's this warmth that kind of disappears a little bit. If you listen to things on this on a CD and you record them on hard drive and with, I don't know, converters and what whatever Pro Tools rig you have, um, it's going to sound different than it's re if it's recorded on tape, right? And... The problem that we have these days is that we 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 like to reminisce and we like to compare stuff from I don't know ten years ago twenty years ago, and it wasn't at all recorded the same way as it is today. So sometimes it can be frustrating if you have sounds that is they're the same instruments. Let's say you get exactly the same instruments, but you recorded them in I don't know digital in the digital domain on a Pro Tool rig. And then you're trying to make them sound exactly like a Michael Jackson record from 1982. It can be a little bit frustrating and very difficult to, to achieve. Absolutely. And um, I think all of that diatribe to say that even to this day, 1997's The Fat of the Land sounds amazing. Oh, it sounds like it was recorded yesterday, if you, if you ask me. It still sounds... Uh, relevant absolutely as if it was as if it was recorded on mars or something it's it sometimes i listen to it and it seems honestly like outwardly it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like 96 97 nothing else sounds like that they did something to it i don't know what it was even to this day it sounds special if it came out today i, w I think we would still find it special yeah well i mean it's a, i guess it's a mix of a lot of things we've talked about the recording techniques the mixing techniques uh, obviously another big component is the choice of syn analog synthesizers. You've talked about the band's name being based off of one of, uh, Moog's, uh, greatest, is it a two analog, uh, two oscillator 
monophonic synth or is this just one oscillator uh well first of all it's probably monophonic it's probably pretty simple it's probably based around one oscillator one oscillator one filter one envelope that's it and an lfo that's pretty much it it was cheap man the project is cheap it's it's two oscillators two you think yeah i'm looking at some photos there but yeah like you said it's 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 very very straightforward but I think that Liam Owlitz's um, sound design is sometimes underrated. Would you uh, would you agree with that statement? I think so. Sometimes we th- we see him play and you think that he's not doing much, but I think he's very creative in how he uses the sounds. He's very um, very minimalistic and not minimalistic in the ways that he's limited in the way he makes sounds. I think minimalistic in the way that he consciously cho- chooses not to put that many sounds and to have like straight to the point to resolve uh, certain phrases or to switch up uh, a synth line or a bass line. I think it shows that he played piano before doing the electro stuff. I don't know what you think. I mean, to me, it's, it, it's all about the raw characteristics of the synth sounds. Uh, the you know the some of the bases are on the cusp of getting into dubstep territory but not quite uh it's it is funky but it's much more distorted and in your face one of the things also i admire uh from him is the fact that you can't really quite tell what synthesizer was used for what like he's not a preset guy really yeah, he tweaks things a lot. He tweaks them a lot. And and he uses like micro loops of different synths. So, so you can't really tell, like like you said, like the where it's from. It's really itsy bitsy things. And you can't also the fun thing about the project, you can't tell if it's like something that was programmed or if it's something that was played. Or they they just have these like super like natural sounding loops and you don't know if it's because is it the synth sound is it the way it was programmed is it because there's a slight mistake in it and they looped it so they have a very organic way of making things and that's that's what I've, i think i've always latched on when i listen to them it doesn't sound like someone hitting the keyboard with one finger you know it sounds almost as if is it a sample is it not a sample is it the keyboard is it you, you can't really tell and i think the the great artists you can't tell where it's from is it a real guitar is it not a real guitar is it a synth through a pedal is it what is it and you're always questioning like what this where the sound is from that's when you know that like there was a lot of research behind it there was a lot of trial and error there was there's someone who's consciously thinking about the sound design and the like which way the album or the songs are going yeah, and I think that there's also a very big performance uh, component to the sound, uh, meaning that, you know, in the early days when they were using non midied up uh, analog synthesizers, you kind of had to play your bass line or your melody with one hand and then either, you know, open up the filter at key places to give it that movement and that, you know, uh, less static feel to... to whatever synth line you were working on. And, and that's something that, uh, unfortunately, I feel like we're, we're losing in the, in the electronic music world nowadays because everything is so perfect with, you know, DAW automation and all of that. So I guess that's, that's, some of the, that's part of the answer to where the organicness, if you will, comes from. Um, and, and so moving on to uh, the next album... I think that's really, that was an eye-opener for you and I in terms of what mastering can really do to a record. Always outnumbered, never outgunned, for me was another revelation. I mean, the fat of the land was incredible. The energy was incredible. The way Always Outnumbered like felt and all the songs that are on it, like just the first one, Spitfire, it like it's the perfect name for the, the the first song by the way once again i think they proved that 
you could push those channels even further up. There was like they were at ten or eleven on fat of the fat of the land, and now they pushed it to twelve. And as I think we were reading in uh, different magazines back then, they really did a a stellar job of mixing it first and then bringing it to the mastering studio and then getting told how they had made mistakes at certain key places in the frequency spectrum and how they went back in the studio and fixed those little mistakes to be able to push the sound even further up and to be able to be even louder and even more to keep the sound concise and very precise but still be able to make it a little bit louder and a little bit more loud and i think who did the mastering with that it was the i think it was uh that girl emily, from emily lazar emily lazar, emily lazar. Yeah. she's even to this day i think she's one of the the, the top uh, mastering engineers uh in rock even heavy metal i think uh one of my revelation uh, i think i listened to that album uh, a lot of times and uh We can get into specific songs, but I don't know, Get Up, Get Off, um, Hot Ride, to Action Radar. I think the one, I think there's one that samples uh, Thriller or there's, there's like a small Michael Jackson sample in there, I think. Medusa's yeah, Path. I, I don't know. I think it's uh, it's from the, the, the break, you know, around like the four minute mark when it's just mm -hmm. a little bass and, and drums break. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. they... they They kind of took that and beefed it up. Somehow. Yeah, exactly. I think it's it's thriller. I think the the, the little. What break song is, is that again? Because I'll go back to listen to it after the episode. I don't know. Is it? I'm not sure. Maybe Medusa's Path or Phoenix or mm. I don't know. Okay, towards towards the end of the album. Yeah, something like that. Also, the song with uh, um, who's the rapper that did it? Um, the uh, rapper. Cool Keith. No, no, no. There's another rapper that raps super fast. Uh, his name uh, Twista. is Twista. Yeah, I think on uh, Get Up, Get Off. So a lot of... It's strange. Strangely enough, it's an album that wasn't well well received by the fans. I thought it was awesome the way it just kicked the crap out of everything out there. But yeah. it was, maybe it's it was a different. Bit too polished. Yeah, maybe. But it was different. It's so I don't. I don't know. Yeah, and also Flint is not like the the main vocalist on most of the like the most important tracks. Yeah, I guess yeah. that. Uh, Fat of the Land was a more uh, collaborative effort. I think. Uh, I think Maxim did two or three tracks. Flint also collaborated in two or three tracks. So it was maybe more of a a band effort on that that album. I mean, for me, it was really. Uh, just a continuation of all of the great things I liked about the sound of the prodigy. As you said, you know, when Spitfire starts, and I mean, I, I remember us listening to it in the uh, La Mine d'Orient and we were just like dumbfounded by how powerful and loud and all the transients were intact and everything was so punchy and, and big And uh, I mean, even to this day, you would ask me to make a track that bangs that much and I'd have a, I'd have to spend like two weeks on just this one single track to get it all right. And, and I would probably have to go back to some old pieces of gear to get that sound right. Because, uh, I mean, again, it's, it's always this endless debate about whether analog can be reproduced uh inside of the box and i think that it's impossible and i think that as you said during the mastering stage also you know it was said that liam howlett had in the second room a pro tools rig with his d8b and he would touch up on all of the mixes according to emily lazar's notes just so he could squeeze in a bit more bass here and there or maybe bring up the kick on that one and then you know so That those are things that you cannot do un unless you work with really talented and open-minded individuals. And so, so I mean, that's why, you know, again, uh, 
is always outnumbered uh, from tw- uh, 2004. Yeah, so, so, so that's 16 years. And if you listen to the newest uh, Skrillex or the newest, you know, Boys Noise or Zomboy or stuff like that, that has kind of the same energy, I'm pretty sure you would find that this old record is still as punchy, if not more probably even feels louder in some key places so i mean again that's why we analyze these these uh, household names don't we on the podcast is to remind ourselves that uh you know old pieces of gear old ways of doing things are still valid and and we have to be able to integrate you know the best of both worlds in our productions because I, obviously I would never trade Ableton for anything in the world, but I mean, that's also why I'm still buying old keyboards and uh, old, um, you know, effects unit and stuff just to route the sound out of the computer, get it back in there with some extra something, you know. There's there's nothing, nothing's going to beat uh, putting a mic or a couple of mics in front of a, an MPEG or a Marshall stack. And just recording that raw, uh, fully distortioned guitar or bass or synth directly through an amp or something. There's an like an, a special analog feel to letting that electricity go through the wires, the pickups, the the the, the amplifiers, and everything that you kind of can't totally recreate uh, in the box. And it's those like nonlinear things and sometimes small feedback loops or that noise that was because the current in the building wasn't quite right. And the, the fact that you can hear the radio because when you're not playing and stuff like that, it's that those little things that bring that sometimes the it's the things that we try to get rid of sometimes that bring in the most the most organicness to the sound and the those things that we don't quite know where they come from. Well, I think they come from mistakes and they come from non-linearity that analog gear usually brings with all, all the noise and that they bring. They also bring uh, some, some magic that we don't quite know where, where it comes from. There's also, uh, you know, the fact that some instruments just have that magic in them. And there is one that I realized uh, when researching their kit list that was used used both by uh, the Prodigy, the Chemical Brothers, uh, and then uh, even going back to Daft Punk. And uh, what would be the keyboard you think that they all use extensively? SH101? Uh, that's, that's a good pick, but that's not the one I had in mind. A keyboard or a drum machine? A keyboard. Juno 106. There we go. There we go. Yeah, Juno 106 is six is one keyboard. I have to say, I would have never thought that uh, the Prodigy used extensively, but uh, in an interview, and I think uh, Howlett was working on, if I'm not mistaken, it's either Invaders Must Die or the one after. But basically, he was saying that he wanted to get back to his roots by shortening and drastically cutting his kit list. He basically said that he sold his old, uh, his old um, uh, studio gear from the SX uh, studio up in London. And uh, he kept only like two or three keyboards, one of which was the, the Juno 106. And I just found that funny because to me, the Juno 106 is kind of a soft sounding keyboard. But I guess that if you have the right effects unit, you can definitely get some incredibly, you know, uh, in your face and edgy sounds out of it. Um, I don't know. Like I said, I've always told you that the the 106, it's a, it's a desert island synth. It's something that just always sounds good. Whatever you want to do with it, it sounds good. It's, it's limited in the, it doesn't do everything well, but then again, what does? But in what it's good at, it's super good at. And it's got that special silkiness required on most stuff. So, And yes, like you said, 
if you want to make it aggressive, if you want to do something else with it, you can just run it through a couple of distortion pedal or two or three or a couple saturation units or chorus or whatever you want. And you get a total, totally different analog organic sounding instrument. Absolutely. I think that uh, it was one of my best purchases uh, of the past year for sure. It really, really has that magic little something that uh, some other synth that I have in my arsenal qu doesn't quite have. But then it's good to have precision also, which, which the, 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 the 106 doesn't quite have. And I guess that's part of its magic. You know, it's kind of fuzzy in the top end. It's, it's very warm. The, 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 the low end is kind of not super tight and i guess that's also a good thing uh depending on what kind of baseline you're trying to achieve but uh yeah i mean what other uh synthesizers made in your opinion the sound of the prodigy besides the prodigy the moog what else i think he used he uses a lot i think even to this day um the virus access ti he uses it a lot i think that's uh pretty it's part of the Prodigy sound. Uh, of course, SH-101. I think that's part of the the dirty, those dirty bass lines come from the SH-101, uh, Roland. Um, of course, MC-30 from back in the days. I heard that he had a, a, a fully meated up mini Moog also. I've never, I had never heard of a, of a fully midied up Mo mini Moog in my life, but apparently they do exist back in the days they would modify they would take a, a mini moog a model d and they would modify it to to be a to be midi compliant i think it was who did that i think it was i'm not sure there was a, a special company they would basically remove the they would basically remove the moog from the the casing and everything and they would make it like rack mount and it would be yeah. it would be midi compliant i think Oh, because I heard that uh, you had Liam to, Hallett. You had to buy like, your own, like your the, own Model D. Yeah, and then that's pay, one thing, and, and then pay extra to get it modified. <laughs> but apparently, it doesn't sound the same. Liam Hallett, in an interview, was saying that even though he liked to have a, a mini, a mini up mini Moog, it didn't sound like the the mini Moog prior to that modification. Which is kind of surprising, I guess, because the circuitry and all of the chips and all of that are the same. But somehow he said that it didn't have the same grit or, you know, power. That uh, also live, I think he uses he uses uh, Voyagers. Like, oh yeah, I think these days he has mostly Voyagers for for live. Maybe not today, but I've seen pictures where from like ten years ago or seven years ago, and he had a. There's a Voyager in there. The Prodigy also has, in my opinion, some of the best uh, non-traditional use of the 303. Yeah, they also have the TB303. Yeah. You like they know how to make it nasty. Yeah, nasty. Not that squelchy, but nasty. So... Um, you, you touched upon something that uh, might be a good uh, time to talk about is their uh, live performances. Because, again, kind of in the same vein as uh, the Chemical Brothers, I think that the pro what made the difference in the live experience with the Prodigy is the fact that Liam Hallett tried to perform most of the like the tracks from the songs live he tries to play them like not all of them but most of them and also uses um a lot of traditional musicians because what we don't see in the prodigy lineup is that they work with a lot of musicians right um they're not like i don't think they're officially part of the band but uh, they were working with like for live. They all they always have like a um, a bass a bass player, drums, percussion. They usually have a a guitar god with them to get that that big uh, spitfirey sound uh, to the drums. 
And I think that adds a lot to their live sound, the fact that they have a like a full band with them. And plus it's DJ slash uh, hype man singers, Keith, Maxim. So it mixing that with all the electronics, the keyboards, the playback, um, the synth and everything, I think it it's a, it's a very good mix and it's a very good way to have uh, a lot of energy uh, throughout the show. It's not, it's never just around the DJ or just around the MC or just around the singer or the guitar player. It's all of them like pushing out sound and everyone like gives out energy. I think it, I've never seen them live, but I would love to see them live. They don't, they don't really come to America all that much. No, I think. no, no, no. I've, I've, I don't even remember like the, the recent tours. I don't even I think I read somewhere that they, after after um, Fat of the Land, they kind of fell off uh, in the eyes of the the American public somehow, and they, they just didn't even bother to come back here somehow. Uh, I guess, and and I guess it's it's kind of their punk mentality also is that they are not trying to give you a second Fat of the Land anytime soon or even ever. And uh, I guess that's that's the appeal also of bands like that. Like the the seminal electronic bands are never trying to create the perfect single. They're just trying to get that energy out uh, the best way they know how, and and it, it it gives you what the prodigy has achieved is you know not necessarily all classics, but at least they're they're very true to their foundation. I think they've never strayed for from what they want to do, and it's pretty much whatever they want to do anytime. Even I think usually you look at it's kind of like the Chemical Brothers. You you listen to their albums, and they're not all the same. Sometimes they want to go in different directions. They're really more focused on creative and being being creative and creating something unique, something that they want to express at a certain time in their careers. And like you said, not necessarily obsessed with getting that next single or having that meeting with uh, the A&R or something and saying, well, we're going to choose the best song for the single on the album, etc. Right. And I think they stayed true to themselves and they've evolved. And so I must admit, I don't like the recent stuff as much as I like the old stuff, but there's still always a couple of gems on each album uh, that I that I like uh, and that I feel that is either reminiscent or that it's pushing the boundaries to something new or that it still has that, that great prodigy uh, energy that we, we've come to love so much. Yeah. So what do you think of Invaders Must Die? Um, invaders, I was kind of disappointed. Um there's maybe three, four tracks on that that I like. I think it kind of it goes a little bit round in circle very fast. It for me it doesn't have enough diversity on it. It can it kind of sounds the same. I mean, Omen is a good one. Take Me to the Hospital is a great one. But I don't know. There's just something that I like the stuff that they did after more. I think. I like the day is my enemy better and no tourist. No tourist, I think, is a little bit more. I, they they were kind of limiting limiting themselves. I mean, the day is my enemy is a huge album. I mean, there's what so many songs on there. Um, like plenty of remixes. Also, I don't know if the remixes originally uh, came with the album, but on the on the Spotify. On the Spotify page, there's a lot of remixes of the songs. Um, but No Tourist, I kind of enjoyed it. There's this, there's a coherence to the album. And um, that that one I would probably recommend. I think it was maybe they, like, how can I say this? They didn't stop themselves from exploring like different avenues and not be scared to have stuff that's a little bit slower or something that's a little bit different 
mixed a little bit kind of like what the chemical brothers do with like sometimes they have like high energy beginnings and then uh, songs that are a little bit slower at the end so yeah i enjoyed no tourist more than uh, the other the other two and it's the least it's the most recent i don't think they i don't think they did any other other album uh since uh keith flynn's late passing uh, in 2019 Yeah, 2019, I think it was in March. Yeah, I mean, I, I gotta agree with you. I'm I'm perfectly on the, on the same page. Like the day is my enemy. Out of the last three, is probably my favorite. No tourists. I mean, I liked uh, Boom Boom Tap. Was kind of a breath of fresh air with the like the almost trap beginning on the song, and then it still has that in your faceness uh, later on in the track. But I mean, to me. It kind of feels like they're just polishing the sound, but they're not really evolving all that much, which is what doesn't draw me back to those newer albums, unfortunately. Uh, they they have perfected the production side of things, but in terms of writing, um, they don't seem to have that knack for that, that little catchy loop at the beginning of each track. You know, that makes those those uh, Fat of the Land, uh, uh, you know, standout tracks, classics, you know. And I, and I, I mean, I mean, Liam Hallett would probably go tell ourselves to fuck off because that's exactly what he's trying to not do. But I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's one thing like another thing that I. I find difficult with the prodigy, especially with the newer stuff is he seems to go for the all out bangers all the time, you know, that, and not enough like space to breathe, you know, you know, like it's, it's, it's right in there, like with the drums and the bass, whereas like fat of the land and even always outnumbered had those like huge intros, very airy, a lot of space for anticipation Whereas it's right to the beat with these uh, newer ones. And, you know, that's that's what The Prodigy is about. But then again, like, I don't need more than two or three tracks in my day of that kind of energy to, to yeah. get going. You know what I well, mean? Well, that's what I, I was saying earlier. Like, I I, I kind of take all the last, the, the latest albums, all that kind of all together. Because I only enjoy probably four or five tracks on each. I would probably make a playlist out of those. Um, but at the same time, I respect the whole, um, let's say on the day is my enemy it tracks, like get your fight on to go listen to it. Sometimes I feel like maybe I didn't give the albums enough time. And if I would listen probably to them two or three times or four times in a row, maybe I would start to find the, uh, like the gems a little bit like what we were saying, uh, on the, the justice podcast that some albums we didn't really like from the get-go but then after listening to them two years later and re-listening to tracks then you start to find the gems and start to to understand more of the concept and how the tracks fit together sometimes i feel that like the prodigy sometimes i think we have this this image that's so ingrained in our brains that if we listen to two seconds and we don't get that energy that we're used to getting Then we're like, oh, it's like, or if it's a little bit different, or if it's always the same, we're we're quick to turn off uh, to to turn the dial. I think, or it might be a might be an impact of like the days we're living in, like today, now. like like the 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 fact that you have access to all these songs at the same place that you can cut to the the middle of a track super fast and everything. Maybe we're listening to to songs in a more uh, consumption oriented way and maybe before if we had had the, something like the day is my enemy on a cd and we were forced to listen to it and it was the only cd that we had for two weeks maybe we would find that it was the most extraordinary albums of of them all right well i mean i'm i think i'm gonna leave it at that because uh, on these words of wisdom i will have to go back to those later albums and and give them a chance Because uh, I do suffer, like you said, from that uh, short attention span that 
we all kind of seem to uh, get like build the more we use social media and all of that. That being said, I mean, I'm not always like the prodigy. You can't listen at low volumes. You know what I mean? <laughs> you you kind of have to to put it where you feel that kick, like it is right on the brink of distortion in your headphones or or your speakers. I mean. I will never uh, do that to my neighbors, <laughs> so I have to listen to to the prodigies either in my car or in headphones. But I mean, I'm not always uh, in that kind of mood. You know what I mean? It's it's, it's so aggressive. Like they they have never let down their guard <laughs> in terms of aggression and and you know high energy stuff. Yeah, of course. Well, it's uh, it's I think it's in their DNA, right? Yeah. And also, I mean, maybe they're kind of prisoners of their time, but, you know, when you talk about justice, for example, they have such a, an ability to bring a new light uh, on old tracks, whereas, you know, the remixes and all of that for the Prodigy, they're not as, I guess, inventive. Um, so, I don't know, maybe it's the people they surround themselves with but i mean i wish they had a live album that have the, had them perform the way a justice will perform their uh old material live but yeah. they don't really do i mean but they they have a live album i think they have uh yeah world's on fire but yeah it's different it's different like i said we can't they can't all be justice they can't all be daft punk they can't all be chemical brother and I think, like for me, that's a positive. Um, the fact that they're always as aggressive as they are, I think it's a positive because too many bands sometimes they start really high energy and then they they start making country songs at the end of their careers, and you're like, "What's going on? What's going on?" <laughs> But uh, I'm gonna say it's a positive that it's uh, it's better to be too much of something than not enough. That those are my final words of wisdom and the prodigy sure. there there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh big 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 bass energy in there still to this day it's funny that you would point that out because for the longest time i was the guy that didn't want my favorite artists to evolve and just to stay consistent with what i thought was their best sound And then the prodigy does that. I grow up like 15 years later, and that's not what I want anymore. So shame on me, shame on me for for wanting them to to dilute their sound and uh, make it uh, more musical and softer. Because they are serving the same great recipe even in 2018 with the latest uh, album, which I will listen to after we uh, press stop on this wonderful recording that we have going perfect and as a last as a last question what what uh, album or what tracks would you recommend to to someone who's never listened to the prodigy well i'm gonna go for something just a little bit not too obvious and i'm gonna say the uh the song spitfire on uh, always outnumbered never outgunned just because of the 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 sheer power and loudness of Emily Lazar's Perfect Master. And I'll throw one wild card in there. And I'm going to say also Invaders Must Die. I don't know. I like the crispiness of the mix on that one. And I feel like that's like modern day, uh, modern day uh, prodigy at its best. Like evil synthesizers and uh, yeah. yeah. What about you? Um, I'm gonna recommend to, to someone who's a newcomer to the Prodigy. I'm gonna recommend their uh, their law, the singles, 1990 to 2005 uh, compilation album that they did in 2005, and. Most of the great songs are on there, and they've kind of reworked them. Um, Spitfire is a 
a different version. It's not exactly the way we 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 listen to it, but it's it's pretty much the same. But it just has a little different sound. If you're curious, go listen to it. Um, they kind of did. They slightly remixed some of their stuff, not like a big like big remixes, but just slight variations. There's a lot of good things. There's Smack My Bitch Up is on there. Girls, uh, Spitfire, uh, Charlie from the earlier albums, uh, Hot Ride also from Always Outnumbered. Um, it's, a, it's a double album, I think. Uh, there's some live stuff on there too. And so yeah, go listen to it. Their Law, The Singles. All right, BK, good talk. Yeah. Take it away, my friend. All right, guys. Well, as we say, uh, we hope that we've inspired you to learn more, listen more uh, to the Prodigy, um, inspire yourselves by their tracks, by their mixes, by the way they make they make music, and uh, go out there and make music. Hopefully, uh, one day we'll we'll hear you guys and uh, listen to those big bangers that you'll be making uh, this week. So, all right, have a great week, guys. Peace. Peace out. Thanks for listening to the podcast, guys. Remember to subscribe if you like what you hear. We're on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. Also, if you want to support us, head on to DelicateBeast.com. You can find our serum packs, our contact instruments, and also plenty of freebies if you subscribe to the newsletter. Don't forget to follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook. And once again, keep making that awesome music.